When will the Messiah come? Tap the screen, share the live. Don't miss this, everybody. Now, for those uh, in the room, uh, you, you may think I'm going out of my mind, but I'm not. I'm looking at a Galaxy Notepad here for the TikTokers. I'm recording at a camera for YouTube. So I'll be going back, and as I can, I'm going to be monitoring chat here on a TV screen. So as I can, and in context with the lecture, uh, I'll answer your questions as I can. Spark One, Betsy Clark, Rodney, Gemini, welcome. OK, here we go. When will the Messiah return? Oh my goodness. We have to ask ourselves the question, is new truth being revealed? Yes or no? Is God done speaking? I think not. What is a revelation? Encyclopedia Americana puts it like this. A profound experience in which there comes about a whole new way of perceiving the world and understanding the place of human life in it. Things are perceived in new relationships and new depth and the horizons of self-understanding are expanded. I contend that we are indeed in a time when new truth is being revealed. Tap the screen, share the live. When will Christ return? Can we know? Well, Jesus said he was going to tell us more truth. What? How could I say such a thing? Well, John 16 says it, not me. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears he will speak, and he will show you the things to come. He will guide you into all truth. Jesus, I would assume Jesus was a man of his word. He's promising that everything is going to be known at some point in the future. He continues in the 16th chapter and says the following. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, figurative stories. But the time comes when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I will show you what? Plainly of the Father. Plainly of the Father. Tap screen, share it alive, everybody. Thank you. So, from the biblical perspective, we're going to be talking from the Bible perspective today, okay? Adam and Eve were in the ideal. They had a fall of some sort, which we'll talk about at another time in depth. God begins a restoration providence right away. 2,000 years after the fall, Moses comes with the Ten Commandments and the Old Testament. 2,000 years after that, Jesus comes with the New Testament Gospels. Jesus is unalived, for the TikTok audience, unalived, assassinated, and has to come back and says he's coming back, he's returning, which places us ultimately in the completed Testament age. We have Old Testament, New Testament, completed Testament age. At each point along the providential scale, God is trying to bring people from the previous providence into something new. Out of chaos after the fall, God brings Moses with the Ten Commandments, some kind of rails to run on, right? I am not an ordained minister, Gypsy, but hang with me. You're going to love this. <laughs> so Moses comes to, to, to begin to construct some kind of order, some kind of social order out of absolute chaos. Remember in Genesis 6, 6, God says, I repent that I created man. What? Wow, okay. So Jesus comes and is trying to bring the Old Testament folks into something new. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And the law is summed up in these two. Love God, love your neighbor. The first five commandments are vertical between man and God. The second five are horizontal between people. All right? So Jesus is coming to, to bring people from this age into his age, into the New Testament gospel age, right? So now Jesus gets unalived, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, in, as we move on in this presentation, I'll briefly touch on what happened to Jesus and why, okay? So now we got to deal with the second coming. Second coming is going to shock the world exactly as Jesus shocked 2,000 years ago. Christians especially, be ready, have your, have your tinfoil hat on and your antennas polished because the second advent is going to shock you. <laughs> oh, Mike, you're, you're shocked by a graph. Really? <laughs> a historical graph. You've got to be kidding. Come on. Get on board with me, okay? 
If you take the word history, divide it into two words, what do you get? His story. What? That's right. History is not just a series of random disconnected events, but God's effort to bring back the ideal, the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's what God has been about all this time. <laughs> oh, stay with me, CH. <laughs> here we go. Now, regarding the second coming of Christ, it says here, but of now this is in Mark 1332. I can't make this stuff up, everybody. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son. <laughs> Jesus says, I don't know when I'm coming back, but the Father. What? That's right, I said it. <laughs> Jesus clearly foretold of his return, yet he added that no one knew of the day and hour of his return, not even himself. Even Jesus said he did not know when he was coming back. Can you imagine this? Amazing. But God does know. And, boom, God reveals his secrets to his prophets. Nevertheless, we can deduce from the, spiritual, the scriptural verse, surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. God will surely reveal all secrets about the second advent to his prophets before he carries out his work. Before he carries out his work. Hang with me. <laughs> My wife just came online. Excellent. <laughs> so if Jesus didn't know, then no reason to trust him. Oh, no, there's all kinds of reasons to trust him. It shows that Jesus wasn't God the Father. That's all. <laughs> now, seat belts fastened, thinking caps on. <laughs> Especially Christians, <laughs> get your tinfoil hat on. Get your seatbelts fastened and get ready for a really rough ride. This could, be, this could be hard for you. In our last presentation, we discussed about how the Messiah will return. We're going to briefly, briefly touch on how the Messiah will come. Seatbelts fastened. We need to go into the book of Revelation for this, right? And we're going to into, right into verse 1, Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. And it says the following. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Let's break that down. This is going from God to Jesus to the angel to John. Okay, very simple. It's very important because in a red letter edition of the Bible, in a red letter edition, a lot of revelation is in red, meaning Jesus is speaking. Jesus is speaking. Revelation 2, 26. Listen carefully now. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking. He who overcomes and does my will to the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. What in the world is Jesus saying? He's saying that Jesus is going to bestow on someone else authority over the nations. And he, someone else, shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Jesus is saying that the power that I have, the power that comes from God to me, will be transferred to someone else. I will also give him, somebody else, the morning star. He who has an ear, again, seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, what's that morning star? That morning star must be really important, right? <laughs> okay, stay with me. Revelation 22, 16 identifies the morning star. I, Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. We know who the morning star is. It's Jesus. And Jesus says, I will give whoever overcomes, will I give the morning star. In other words, is Jesus going to give him himself? It could be a position. Stay with me. Revelation 2.17, seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on. 
Here we go. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows except he who receives it. Oh my goodness, what's the hidden manna? The Bible is clear about what the hidden manna is. John 6, 33, For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Hidden manna. What is the white stone? 1 Peter 2, 4, Christ equals the living stone, the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 10, 5, The rock was Christ. It looks like Jesus is saying he's transferring the position and power of the Messiah to someone else. The stone means the role of the Messiah, the chief cornerstone. <laughs> the Antichrist is communism. <laughs> Your accusation is misplaced, my friend. Now, a new name written. Interesting. Let's go to Revelation 19, 11, and 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. This is a leader of nations, not just a king, not just a prince, but a king of kings. And he had a name written that no man knew except he himself. Jesus is talking about a global leader that, and only the Messiah would know who he is. Jesus knew he was the Messiah before anybody did. <clears throat> and he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. John 1, and the Word was made flesh, John 1, 14. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. King of Kings, Lord of Lords. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you guys ain't praying enough, I tell you. Revelation 3.12. Him who overcomes, now listen to this, seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on. If you haven't heard a thing yet, hear this. Him who overcomes will I. Now remember, Jesus is talking, Revelation 1.1, this is Jesus speaking. Him who overcomes, in other words, someone else who overcomes will I, Jesus, make a pillar in the temple of my God. <clears throat> and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. Interesting and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and I will write upon him, seatbelts fastened, my new name. Jesus is saying that at the second coming of Christ, it will be someone other than Jesus. There's no way around this. This is a very truncated, shortened version of this, because this is a prelude to what else I'm going to talk about. Which, where, this is how the Messiah is coming back. Boom. Messiah will come back, born on earth, with a new name. Just like he did 2,000 years ago. God has been trying to restore, on the earth, Adam, Eve, child. Centered on God, family, society, nation, world. No magic tricks. No, you're not going to fly off the earth into the sky. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. When will Christ return? But you, brothers, are not in darkness, that the day should come upon you as a thief. You are all children of the day. We are uh, not of the night, nor darkness. 1 Thessalonians 5. If, therefore, you do not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I am coming. Jesus was alive for 33 years, and a small handful of people knew who he was. A tiny handful of people and he died in obscurity, right? Israel's destroyed, John the Baptist is beheaded, Jesus is crucified, the Roman Empire destroys Israel, the Goths destroy the Roman Empire, and the Dark Ages begin. 
I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Hey, Eric, Erling, <laughs> Erling the Viking, my friend. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. It's not the rapture. They're not going anywhere. What happened when Peter and Andrew were confronted by Jesus at the water's edge? One was taken, one was left. That's all it is. People recognize the Messiah and follow. Two shall be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. One will recognize the Messiah and follow. Drop your nets. I'll make you fishers of men, Jesus said. Right? He didn't take them off in the sky, and nobody's going in the sky. The ancient Jews expected, the, based on Daniel 7, 13, that it would be a celestial happening. When Jesus was born as a baby on earth, they never could get it. They couldn't pull it together. Tap screen, share it alive. Here we go. Some will know, others will not. Many people recognize Jesus, but the majority did not because their hearts weren't right. Their hearts weren't right. It's a matter of the heart. Now, let's go into when will the Messiah come. Everybody ready? Ha <laughs> ha, here we go. Seat belts fastened. Now, we're gonna talk about the national level foundation to receive the Messiah. How does this start? This starts with Jacob. In Genesis 32, Jacob wrestles the angel at the fort of Jabbok and is renamed Israel which begins the nation of Israel. Boom. They go into slavery in Egypt in fulfillment of the promise that upon the failure of Abraham's sacrifice, he would be a slave in the land not his own for 400 years. So boom, into slavery they go for 400 years. Moses comes at about 430 in, into, this, into the judges uh, period. The last judge, Samuel, anoints Saul the king of Israel. All right? Saul passes the, the crown to David. David passes it to Solomon. This is 120 years of the United Kingdom. Solomon falls into corruption. Israel is divided into 12 tribes. Two to the south, 10 to the north. Divided kingdom for 400 years. Follow with me. This is going to blow your mind. Tap the screen. Share the live. <laughs> I haven't even started. <laughs> so, two tribes are taken into Babylon for 70 years. The uh, 10 tribes of, of the north are taken into Assyria. There's a Babylonian exile and return over 400, 140 years. They return back in three waves back to Israel in 538 BC. Every historian worth their salt says this happened in 538, which is right on time with this, this uh, uh, chart. Malachi comes, the last Old Testament prophet, what's considered a minor prophet, but he figures in large in the whole story of Jesus and even now. <clears throat> Malachi was a reformer. This begins the final preparation period, 400 years. What happens in that 400 years, everybody? <laughs> Hellenism. Hebraism, Roman Empire is at its zenith. Confucius, Buddhism, Socratic thought. Confucius and Buddha are appearing in the East. There's this entire global preparation to receive Jesus, not to assassinate him, and Socratic thought. The Greeks and the Romans were, uh, had very advanced architecture, science, transportation, trade routes, etc., etc. And then finally, Jesus is born on this foundation of 2,000 years. <laughs> so, so what happened right, right there? What happened to Jesus and why? Let's, let's examine this. John the Baptist figures in really large. Malachi 4, 5 says Elijah would come. John the Baptist is Elijah, according to Matthew 11, Matthew 17. So here's what it should have looked like. Jesus and John the Baptist. John the Baptist has 120 disciples, right? Around the disciples is the nation of Israel. Israel is convinced that John the Baptist is the Messiah, according to Luke 3.15. 
right? Israel thinks John the Baptist is the Messiah. Luke 3.15. Static sound? Is there, there's a sound in the background. It's probably the uh, projector, Amanda. Unfor yeah, it's right under my, uh, my camera, unfortunately. Very sorry. There's nothing I can do about it. So around the disciples, Israel, Israel is watching John the Baptist every single move. Around Israel, Israel is occupied by the Roman Empire. Israel is occupied by the Roman Empire. And as the adage went of the time, all roads lead to Rome. All roads lead to Rome. Rome dominated the entire Mediterranean, parts of North Africa, all of Western Europe, and the Middle East. And around the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire had uh, ways uh, and communication with the entire planet, trade routes, uh, uh, waterways, etc. So, essentially, there was tremendous global internal and external preparation for the coming of Jesus. The entire planet seems to be getting ready for something, right? Buddha, Socrates, Confucius, all these people came before Jesus and began enormous movements all around the world, right? Yeah, sorry, everybody. The, the sound you're hearing is probably, uh, my pad is about six feet away from the uh, projector. So you're hearing a, a hiss from the, from the projector. I'm very sorry. I hope it's not too loud. So what should have happened was Jesus and John the Baptist together should have advanced on to the global scale. The Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Who's the light? Jesus is the light. And that all men through him might believe. John the Baptist was supposed to lead everybody in Israel to Jesus and thereby to the world. But that did not happen. What happened? 1 Corinthians 2, 7, 8, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this age knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What is the hidden wisdom? It must have been, don't crucify the Lord of glory. Jesus was not supposed to die like that. He was not supposed to be unalived like that. So what happened after the beheading of John the Baptist and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? What happened? They're gone. Disciples are gone. Israel is destroyed by the Roman Empire in 70 AD. Roman Empire is invaded by the Goths in the 4th century. And the world goes into the Dark Ages. Oh, not this again. I hope this comes back. We are in trouble. I'm having a problem with my um, projector here. It might be timing out. Okay, here we go. We're back. Ah, so this is what happened. Once Jesus and John the Baptist are gone, this entire foundation is lost. God did not ordain the death of Jesus Christ. Absolutely not. God allowed that, but that wasn't his primary will. God's primary will was for Jesus to be embraced first by John the Baptist. John the Baptist brings Jesus to the hierarchy of Israel. Israel brings Jesus to Herod, and Herod transports Jesus to Rome. Imagine Jesus standing in the Colosseum with T Tiberius Caesar, and Tiberius Caesar introduces uh, Jesus to the Roman Empire. What happens then? What kind of a world would we be living in now? Yeah, projector went into the dark ages, exactly correct. <laughs> so, now, let's pick up our story. Now, we've taken a little bit of a detour to show what happened at the time of Jesus. At the end of our, of our 2,000 year period of the history of Israel, from Jacob to Jesus, now we're going to pick it up. Once Jesus is, is crucified, God begins a brand new providence of Christianity on the global scale. This is the national level foundation to receive the Messiah. God is working on a national level to bring the Messiah here in Israel, right? There's only two scriptures predicting the death of Christ. 
Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is fulfilled in Matthew. He will come with healing in his wings. God's entire hope, there were 600 scriptures in the Old Testament predicting the Lord of glory. God's every hope, God's every investment was that they would embrace Jesus, accept Jesus, and he would occupy the throne of King David. That, according to uh, uh, Isaiah 7, no, actually, uh, Daniel 7, 13. And Daniel, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9. So now we're on the world level foundation to receive the Messiah. Jesus has been crucified and now the providence moves from the national level to the global level now. Global level. Here we go. So just like Jacob's 12 sons and 70 kinsmen, Jesus begins with 12 disciples and 70 apostles. Amazing. Boom. What happens? Just like 2,000 years before them, instead of going slavery in Egypt, they go into persecution in Rome for 400 years. <laughs> persecution of the Romans. Finally, uh, Constantine in 313 uh, stops the persecution of the Christians. And then finally, Theodosius II declares Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in 392. It takes 400 years for Christianity to be accepted in the Roman Empire. After unspeakable persecution and martyrdom. By this time, the New Testament is canonized and we begin the, the period of patriarchs or the popes. The Catholic Church begins to mobilize and energize and is the central focus of the Christian world at that time. Right? Charlemagne is crowned king of the Holy Roman Empire on Christmas Day, interestingly enough, just like David was crowned 2,000 years before him. How terribly interesting. They say history repeats itself. It really does. History literally repeats itself. And hang on, tap the screen, share the live, because boy, we are, we're gonna, this is gonna chirp the tires in just a few minutes. Charlemagne's crown king of the Holy Roman Empire, Christmas Day on 800, beginning the United Kingdom, Charlemagne passes the crown to Louis the Pious, Louis the Pious passes it to his three sons, Lothair, Louis II, and Charles the Bald. That's right, Charles the Bald. What? But what happens in 1054, the Great Schism, beginning in 919 and finally erupting in 1054, the Great Schism, so, which became the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Franks or the Roman Catholic Church. All right? <laughs> now, Again, this is exactly what happened 2,000 years prior to this. Israel was divided north and south. Now, Christianity is divided east and west. How amazing. God is, if nothing else, precise. God is the king of time. God is the king of order. And God has a formula for restoration. The papacy is abducted and taken into Avignon, France for 70 years from 1307 to 1377. The Council of Constance restores the papacy to Rome with Martin V. Martin Luther comes in 1517 just the way Malachi did 2,000 years before as a reformer 400 years prior to the coming of Christ. How terribly interesting. What's going on here? Well, Martin Luther himself saw the parallels and wrote about it. Oh my goodness. He talked about the Babylonian captivity of the church. He saw the parallels between what happened in Israel 2,000 years before and what happened in Christianity in the 14th century. Very interesting. History repeats itself. Tap the screen, share it alive. Let's continue. So now, papacy abducted, the Council of Constance, blah, blah, blah. Martin Luther comes. That begins a final preparation period for the coming of the Messiah. Oh my goodness, we're not done. We're not done yet. Seat belts fastened, thinking caps on, everyone. Everybody get your seat belts on. Get your seat belts on. Tap the screen, share the life. Thank you very much for the likes. Share this out. Here it comes. <laughs> Who's here? Thessalonians 2. <laughs> Thanks for the likes, guys. Here we go. Now, 
Remember, we were talking about the national level restoration in Israel now with the death of Jesus Christ. We are now on the global scale. What's been happening the last 400 years? What happened 2,000 years prior to this? Hebraism, Hellenism, the Roman Empire, science, technology, travel, communication, right? All kinds of global preparation. The entire planet seems to be getting ready for something. Jesus comes, boom, everything gets destroyed. John the Baptist is beheaded. Jesus is crucified. Israel is wiped out. The Roman Empire is overcome by the Visigoths in the 4th century. And the world goes into the Dark Ages. What's been happening now for the last 400 years? The Renaissance, the Reformation, the USA and the USSR have arisen as global powers of Cain and Abel. Industrial revolution, space travel, explosion of religion. We have now a global village. A global village. Oh my goodness. What can you do with one of these? What can you do with one of these? Everything. We are in a very, very special time. Let's take a look. Remember we talked about the 2,000 year national level foundation to receive the Messiah with Jacob and his 12 sons and 70 kinsmen. Boom. National level, global level. If you put these on top of each other, seat belts fastened, thinking caps on, pay attention. Pay attention. This is it. You have identical time periods, boys and girls. The phrase history repeats itself is not just a phrase. It's not idle. It's real. History actually repeats itself in excruciating detail. This is how we know we are in the final time, the end of time, the last days. It gets worse. Seat belts fastened, thinking caps on, tap the screen, share it alive. Where does that put us? Well, look at this. Martin Luther's tact is 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg in 1517. Just like Malachi was a reformer 2,000 years before him, which began a 400-year preparation period for the coming of the Messiah. Messiah is born 400 years after Malachi. Well, here we are. Martin Luther, the, the, the Malachi figure of the age, 400 years plus, brings us to 1917. Oh my goodness. Well, what happened in 1917? What's so special about 1917? <laughs> What's so special about 1917? Oh my God, the world came apart in 1917. The Bolshevik Revolution happened in 1917, ushering in global communism, which, by the way, receive it or not, is the Antichrist. The mark of the beast is the hammer and sickle. Pray about that. Mark of the beast. Mark in the right hand. Hammer and sickle. <laughs> what else happened? Man-centered paradise. Bolshevik revolution. Communism. Worker ownership of the means of production without God. Purely horizontal management of the planet. U.S. enters World War I. Interestingly, oh my goodness. This 1917 is really, really turning out to be something, isn't it? Which just happens to be 400 years Hence, from Martin Luther nailing his 95 Theses on the church door at Wittenberg, Germany. Oh my goodness. Yes, we are in a special time. Look. Oh my goodness. What's the third thing? The Bible says in Matthew 24, 14 that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world and then the end will come. That happened in 1917. According to the Gideons, they said the gospel, the Bible was printed in every known language on earth by 1917. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the entire world and then the end will come. We are in a very, very special time. Let's go back. Just, <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. This is a historical timeline. This is, you can pick up any history book and see this. The history of Israel on the national level and the history of Christianity on the global level have what's called an identical providential time identity. We are in a very, very special time, boys and girls. Very, very special time. So, the Messiah is essentially overdue. This means this can happen any day. Any day. 
<laughs> yeah. Did you come in late, Ryan? <laughs> okay, so there it is. Yoda says, may the force be with you. The universal prime force. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my camera. This is going to go up on YouTube tonight, and I'll talk to the TikTokers. <laughs>